Well, now that we're talking about measuring the exposure, let me ask you another question that goes a little bit beyond your data set. You can't answer this with your Framingham data set as was given to you, but the real data might allow you to do that if you had the detailed Framingham data. If you were really measuring smoking, what do you think is the best way to measure smoking? Should it be just something like presence or absence? And you have that ability. You have a variable called per smoke one at the 1956 exam, which labels a person as a smoker or a non-smoker. But it doesn't make a difference whether a person's smoking one cigarette a day or 60 cigarettes a day. He's still called a smoker. So an alternative is to try to come up with an exposure that measures the intensity, the amount of smoking. And then we have, for that, another variable in your data set called SIG, day, SIG P day 1, which is the actual number of cigarettes. And that might be a better exposure to do, especially if you expect some sort of what we refer to as dose-response relationship. Let's suppose it's not whether you smoke or don't smoke that really determines your incidence or your risk of developing heart disease. It's how much you smoke. Three-pack-a-day smokers have much higher risks than maybe two-pack-a-day smokers who have higher risks than one-pack-a-day smokers who have, might have higher risks than non-smokers. If that's what you'd like to see or expect to see, increasing risk with increasing amounts of smoking, then instead of using the dichotomous curse smoke one, we'd be better off using the more continuous variable, number of cigarettes per day. Well, the other way that smoking is typically um, measured is by looking at, at measures that reflect how long you've been smoking in, in terms of something called pack years. Now, we don't have that in detail in our Framingham data set that we're using, but when you ask a person whether they're a smoker or not, you might also ask them how long you've been smoking. Again, that might be important in terms of a dose-response relationship. A person that's been smoking for 20 years might have a higher incidence of disease than a person who's smoking just for one year. So duration like pack years would be another meaningful measure of association. And then finally, you could try to combine intensity and duration by looking at cumulative pack years, not just asking how much you smoke or asking how long you've been smoking, but combine them by essentially over the years, how many packs of cigarettes have you been smoking? So you might have two people both smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. If one person's been doing it for five years, and another person's been doing it for 10 years, that second person has more of a cumulative effect of pack years because it's been existing for a longer period of time. So these are questions you'd like to think about when you're measuring the exposure when you're designing your cohort study. The next thing you, you have to figure out is how are you going to follow these people over time? How are you going to be the fly on the wall to see what happens to your smokers or to your non-smokers or what happens to your heavy smokers compared to your light smokers compared to your non-smokers? How are you going to follow up people? Well, let me give you two potential ways of doing, actually three potential ways. We can think of how are they doing in Framingham? We've talked about this already. People come back every two years for follow-up examinations. They show up to a cent central site in Framingham, Massachusetts, where they fill out questionnaires about their risk factors, answer questions about whether they've developed any outcomes since the last time you were seen. They're tested, they're prodded, they're poked, and things like that. That's a physical examination, a physical evaluation that happens to each individual every two years. Well, not everyone shows up on the same date. It's staggered, obviously, so this is a continuous operation, but it's an expensive operation. You have to have a staff there to record these individuals and to measure their, their risk factors and outcomes. But that's what Framingham decided to do, and uh, what the investigators decided to do in the Framingham Heart Study. Later on, you're going to be hearing from the investigators of the Nurses' Health Study. They also wanted to update people's information every two years. But they did it by mailings. They would send questionnaires to the mails to a large number of nurses. They started out with 120,000 nurses. Can't you imagine trying to bring 120,000 people every two years to a site to be tested? That would probably be not feasible. But if we can get the information from the mail responses to these questionnaires, then we might be able to get useful information from a much larger cohort. And that's why Nurses Health Study enrolled nurses 
hoping that nurses are willing to fill out questionnaires that come in the mail, put them in an envelope, and send them back. And hopefully when they're filling them out, are cognitive of their risk factor status and their health issues to correctly record these things. So that's another way you could follow people over time. Well, today, we're living in a field of an existence where data is abundant. And if you are seeing your physician, as you should, say, every year, chances are there's an electronic medical record that's being kept on you that's recording all the pieces of information that are, that are being obtained from all the encounters you have in your medical system. How many times you saw your doctor, how many times you might have visited an emergency room, how many times you were admitted to a hospital, the diagnoses that were made, the risk factors that were recorded. So in, in today's era, we might have medical record information on large numbers of uh, people based on clinical encounters. And we can follow people over time by just looking at their electronic medical records. Those records might contain some clinical information. They might also probably uh, contain billing information. Ch chances are the prim primary reason for this data set to be created was to be able to track people, to figure out what to charge to people for, the, for whatever procedures were done on them when they saw their physicians or were admitted to the hospitals. So the information in, that you might have on patients in a healthcare system might be a combination of information based on clinical encounters, medical information, and also billing information that might describe the various interventions, the various procedures that were performed on those people. Now sometimes there are data sets that combine both clinical and billing information. And a, a nice example of that is something called the SEER Medicare data set. The SEER part of the SEER Medicare data set is information gathered from cancer registries, from registries around this country. Meaning if you develop cancer in one of these locations in the, in this, in the states, you would, your clinical information would automatically be uploaded to one central site known as a cancer registry. It would talk about the diagnosis of the cancer, the stage of the cancer, how, when it was diagnosed, how serious it was. In addition to that, if you're above the age 65 in this country, you are, you are enrolled in, in a healthcare system known as Medicare. And that data set will collect information on whenever a billing was made for you that, a, that, a, a, uh, that had to be funded under this Medicare insurance plan. So they will have encounters of all, how many times you saw your doctors, how many times you were admitted, and if you were admitted to hospitals, what procedures and what diagnoses were made on you in that hospital. So the combination of the clinical information from the SEER data set about your cancer and the Medicare information about what happened to you after you developed that cancer, how many times you were hospitalized, what sort of treatments you had, what sort of outcomes you have, allow you to build a cohort using this routinely collected data for two other purposes, from a cancer registry and from an insurance plan. So the way we follow people in cohort studies in part depends on how easy it is to observe information, to collect this information on, on individuals. Well, let's suppose we've gone this far. We've enrolled our people, we decided how to measure the exposure, we've decided how to measure, how to, re, how to observe follow-up on these people, now we have to measure outcomes. What outcomes are you going to want to measure? Well, maybe the primary outcome of interest to most epidemiologists is all-cause mortality. So does some risk factor increase your risk of developing death? But if you want to know whether smoking increases the risk of, of developing death, you might be more interested in deaths that might be attributed to smoking, like, for example, coronary heart disease mortality. And that information is readily available in this country. You can, if you know enough information about a person, specifically if you know their social security number, you can go on the social security web page, type in that number, and you'll find out whether there's been a death certificate filed for that person. And on that death certificate, you can find out the cause of death. So that's a way of following people if your outcome is mortality, even if it's cause-specific mortality, without having to call up people or having them fill out questionnaires or having them come to some central site. Mortality is rel relatively easy to obtain as an outcome in, in this country. If you're interested in morbidity, then you have to have people be examined or fill out questionnaires.
And in your data set, you have a variable called NECHD, as we've been using that as an outcome variable, reflecting both mortality and morbidity related to coronary heart disease. Well, that's called a combination variable or a composite outcome. This variable NECHD is coded as yes or coded as one if any of these conditions occur during the follow-up person, whether the person developed angina, whether the person had a myocardial infarction, coronary insufficiency, that's um, another type of angina, whether they had a fatal heart disease or something, various reasons that you could be classified as developing this composite outcome called NECHD. Now, why do you want to mix all these together? Well, they all have something to do with coronary heart disease, so that's one reason to mix them all together. And what you're getting when you put many individual outcomes together and create a composite outcome is you're going to get more outcomes. Because if you just looked at the outcome, did you develop a myocardial infarction? You'd just be getting a fraction of the people who are positive for that NECHD variable. You would not be getting people who had angina, chest pain, without having a myocardial infarction. So the more more individual components that are put into a composite outcome, the more people are, are going to be classified as outcome positive. And that usually helps you, usually helps you with this in, in a statistical sense. The more outcomes you have, the more power you have for detecting associations. But that combining individual component outcomes into a composite is assuming that all of them might be affected by smoking that smoking not only affects your risk of having a heart attack, a myocardial infarction, but also affects your risk of having chest pain, angina pectoris. And therefore, we can lump those together into a composite outcome that might reflect the effect of smoking. So in this case, it would be a reasonable outcome to consider. Well, what about the person who, has, who develops a heart attack during his follow-up, survives, a year later has another heart attack, survives that, Another two years later has a third heart attack. How do you handle these multiple outcomes when you follow people over time? Well, the usual action is to look at the first event. We're just going to follow people until they develop their first myocardial infarction. And once they have it, we're not going to follow them anymore. We're only interested in the risk of developing a first myocardial infarction. That's typically done in epidemiologic studies. We follow people until they're no longer at risk. Well, you're no longer at risk for a first myocardial infarction. Once you develop a myocardial infarction, your follow-up stops in that case. So that's typically what we see in epidemiology. We don't care what happens to people after their first event. But sometimes clinicians might be interested in what influences having a second myocardial infarction. So an alternative is we might alternatively separate our data set and do separate analyses to answer different questions. For example, we might ask, what's the risk of developing a first myocardial infarction? In which case, once you develop that first myocardial infarction, your follow-up ends. But if we're also interested in the risk of developing a second myocardial infarction, well, first of all, you're at risk for that only after you develop your first myocardial infarction, your first heart attack. That's when the follow-up starts at that type. It ends when you have a second heart attack. So if you're interested in that second question, we might do separate analyses, looking at people who survived their first heart attack, their first myocardial infarction, and follow them now until they develop a second heart attack or the study ends. So the person years at risk now begins for those individuals at the point in which they develop their first heart attack and ends with the development of a second heart attack or the end of the study. So that's another way of handling multiple outcomes on the same individual. Finally, how are we going to measure incidence? Well, we have two ways of doing that. I've talked about cumulative incidence. That can be measured in cohort studies, providing you have complete um, follow-up on individuals. So to measure cumulative incidence, we have to be able to follow everybody for a fixed period of time. So first of all, everyone has to have the same potential follow-up. Everyone's going to be followed for, say, 10 years. I want to measure the 10-year cumulative incidence. I have to have complete follow-up, meaning I have no losses due to being lost to follow-up or losses due to competing risk. So in the Framingham data set, in the homework exercises we've been giving you, to measure cumulative incidence, we've been focusing on things like all-cause mortality, because for that outcome, we have no losses to follow-up, no losses due to competing risks. 
But if you were measuring a different outcome, like a cause-specific mortality or a morbidity, then cumulative incidences won't be appropriate if you have losses to follow up or losses due to competing risks, as we've been seeing in our homework exercises. There you want to measure incidence rates. They are the more general measure of incidence in cohort studies. They're valid to use um, in general when you have incomplete follow-up on people. That's due to being lost to follow-up or being losses due to competing risks. There is, though, an assumption that's embedded in an incidence rate calculation that we have to be sensitive to. It's assuming that the reason, say, you're lost to follow-up has nothing to do with your true risk of developing heart disease, that the reason for being lost is unrelated, not related to your outcome at risk. So, for example, in the Framingham Heart Study, if those people who were lost to follow-up, they never came back to their examinations, we don't know what happened to them. If those people decided not to stay in the Framingham Heart Study because they were very sick, feeling very badly, they had lots of chest pain, and as a result, they moved to another part of the country to see a doctor, a specialist, we might be taking out of our data set people who are very likely to, to develop heart disease had they not been lost. To do this incidence rate calculation, to take all the cases and divide by all the person time, we have to make an assumption that the reason we're losing a person isn't because we're losing the sickest people or we're losing the less sick people, we're losing average people. The reason someone is no longer in our study has nothing to do with their true risk of developing our outcome. And that's an assumption to keep in mind. Well, those are the questions that we have in mind. What I like to do is, is, is say next time we'll move on to the, the next topic of, of cohort studies. So I'll see you then.